none of us is a master of HR, that we need companies like Bent Erickson to protect us, to help create the, the, the employee handbook, to make sure it's up to date, to make sure the changing state and federal laws are included. That's number one. Number two, another area of expertise that Bent Erickson and yourself are really good at is talking about hiring and retaining team members. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. Today, I've got a real treat in store for you because we're going to learn about a topic that is perplexing. I might even add flummoxing to uh, most of us. So please welcome to the Orthopreneurs Podcast, Mr. Alan Twig from Bent, Vice President uh, at Bent Erickson and, Com and Company. Yep. Ben Erickson and Associates. And Associates. thank you so much, Dr. Krieger, for having me on. This is wonderful. Oh, it's my pleasure. We've had we've had Tim on before, uh, mm -hmm. Tim Twig. Uh, we've had Tim and Adrian, I think, speak at an Orthopedist Summit before. I, I don't I don't think you'd ever taken the stage at the summit, had you? No, not yet. Not yet. Emphasis on yet, right? Um, so I'm very familiar with your work, as are many people who are listening, but there are some who just don't really know much about uh, Bent Erickson. So let's start there. Give us that, you know, 60 second elevator pitch about what Bent Erickson is and does, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've been in this world of HR for over 40 years. Our company was actually started by a guy named Bent Erickson, and he was uh, operating out of California. And my father, Tim, bought the business from him over 20 years ago. I joined over 10 years ago. And our leadership team consists of me and uh, Tim and my bonus mom, Adrian. And we're just passionate about HR. You know, it's all that we do. It's it's our focus. And we do the basics like employee handbooks, job descriptions, personnel forms. You know, we keep everything up to date over time with all the changing rules and regulations all over the country and how things vary by how many employees you have and all of that. And then a big thing that we do is we are a service company. So we have a team of folks here, we call them HR specialists, and clients can call us and ask all of their crazy HR questions. So everything from terminations, pregnancy, hiring questions, all of it. And we really support clients through all the crazy situations that come up when you have employees. So it's what we do. It's all that we do. We don't do insurance or taxes or anything else. And uh, we really love it. It's it's our passion. Well, we love that you love it because we need somebody like that. And, you know, 30 plus years in dentistry, um, there's been a lot of changes. I remember when HR was not what HR is today. Um, you know, nobody got written up. No such thing existed. You called someone to your office, had a conversation. It's certainly become a lot more convoluted, uh, a lot more regulatory in those years. Uh, I have to admit with some degree of of comfort and uh, that when we partnered with smile doctors one of the things that i personally no longer need to deal with is the quote-unquote hr situation other than i think all of us no matter whether or not you've associated or not associated um i'd love your feedback on this i don't care who you work for you are you must be hr compliant even if it doesn't mean from a regulatory perspective as an owner of a practice i am still bound as someone who works in the practice under the ever-changing HR laws, uh, yeah. which is truly, you know, I, the fact that I get some of it off my plate uh, mm -hmm. is wonderful, but I can't ever escape it. And I, I'm curious because Ben Derrickson has been around 40 years, and I have to admit, I always thought it was a combination of a Mr. Bent or Mrs. Bent and a Mr. and Mrs. Erickson that came together and created the 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 company. So thank you for the clarification there. Um, but in the 20 years that the company's been uh, in Tim's, you know, purview, if you will, um, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen uh, in the HR world? And it can be broad strokes. And, and what are some of the biggest challenges you see people facing right now? Well, like you said a minute ago, things have changed dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. And I would say that state labor boards are a lot more active than they used to be in terms of passing new state laws. And of course, you have federal laws and state laws. And then with that, of course, rules vary by how many employees you have. And so, you know, that's where making sure that everything is unique for you, your practice size, your state, that's super important. 
In terms of trends, you know, I would say over time we see a big increase in uh, leave of absence protections, you know, pregnancy, uh, disability protections. A lot of states now are passing paid family leave uh, restrictions as well. Um, and by the way, you say restrictions, mm-hmm. right? When you say restrictions, you're meaning opportunity for the team member and restriction on the. Uh, I just I want to be clear about this because it's an interesting term of language. That restrictions means that we as employers or what I was as an employer, we are restricted from uh, doing certain things against them. It's not restriction on the individual trying to take the leave, correct? Yeah, that's correct. As an employer, or in your case, as kind of a business owner, so to speak, with this, yeah, you are bound by that. And so, in a sense, you are restricted from terminating someone for taking one of these leaves of absence. You're restricted from any sort of adverse action. And and certainly, yeah, it 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 you can look at it from the employee standpoint or the employer standpoint. And I uh, I use that term when I'm working with employers because it uh, it is a restriction on the business, um, and it is something to keep in mind that these are protections that are put in place to to benefit the employees because. You know, as a country, we don't have a universal paid family leave program, and we don't have as much action at the federal level around employment laws. It's predominantly more state by state, and it does create a real patchwork where if you're uh, if you're an employer and you operate in multiple states, it can be quite challenging because the rules are going to vary from one state to another. And certainly if you were to compare, you know, Texas where you are to California, for example, it's night and day. I mean, California is an absolute nightmare as an employer. So yeah, lots of variation with that. Yeah. And I've been told California is a a legislative nightmare for so many other places. Um, But it's interesting the things you talk about here. You know, you talked about the protections that are in place for employees you know, I, I'm looking around here. I'm making sure, Alan, nobody's listening. Okay, it's just you and me. So okay. you can be totally honest. Um, do you ever feel like there are protections in place for employees across the board? I'm not referring to leave. I'm just referring to everything. That sometimes you shake your head and go, what are they? I mean, this is this is crazy. Or do you really understand the value of every single law and rule that you tell an employer that they have to abide by? That's a great question. I would say that the vast majority of the rules make a lot of sense, or they make a lot of sense for the time period in which they were passed. You know, there there are old HR protections on the books about uh, folks who are in what's called the Civil Air Patrol, which is people who volunteer their, their personal airplanes in case, you know, we get invaded by some country. Well, that that one you know was really you know beneficial in the 1940s not as much these days a lot of them though are things that are are geared to protect employees and they're also geared to protect public health a big trend right now is state based sick leave protections so these are you know some amount of uh, sick days that employees get and when you read the actual bills that these are that these are passed under um there's a lot of it that's about Um, protecting public health, because the idea is that if you as an employee might get fired for calling in sick for one or two days, well, then, of course, you're never going to call in sick. And when you are sick, you're going to show up to work and you'll get all the, you know, customers and all your coworkers sick. So uh, a lot of these rules are put in place really for for kind of the not so much the dental profession, but Right. But, you know, retail and, and restaurant workers and people like that that don't really have much in the way of benefits. The problem, of course, is we in the orthodontic profession get caught up in that sort of wide net that is used to try to protect everyone, even though most orthodontic employers are kind and compassionate and give people the time that they need and so on and so forth. I think the the craziest rule that's out there is in California, and it's known as the sue your boss law, which is where as an employee, if you bring some sort of claim or suit or uh, some sort of you know issue against your employer, and if your employer is found guilty, liable of that, the state will actually give you as the employee a little cut of the fines that they levy against the employer. Wow. Um, and so that's that's the I would say probably the most extreme one out there as far but that's as that's along the lines of a whistleblower sort of law, right? It is. Right? A yeah, whistleblower it, gets a cut of the action. I'm, if, the, if I'm not mistaken as well, perhaps I'm incorrect. 
They can in some cases, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's an extension of that. And, and really, it's just about, you know, a further thing to keep employers honest. Because if you look back over, you know, 200 years, the vast majority of employers are good and honest. And there are some who, you know, take advantage of employees and don't pay them properly or whatever it might be. And so the government feels the need to step in and protect people. Yeah. Well, you you made some really good points there. And again, I, I've learned over five years or four and a half years of doing this podcast that we have more than just orthodontists who listen, but the vast majority in the orthodontic and dental world. But a lot of what you're talking about applies to everybody across the board. And as employers, I mean, now I'm an employee, right? So I'm on the other side of it, but I don't really think like an employee. I still think like an employer. You know, one of the things that I think we're always concerned about has been the wrongful termination lawsuits, you know, the prejudicial action against somebody that was in no way, shape or form intended as prejudicial, but could be viewed as such. Um, state labor boards, as you mentioned, uh, even federal level kind of stuff. You know, I want to ask you a question related to something similar to what we think about as as clinicians, which is practice defensive medicine, right? And and all because, you know, we tend to do what we think is right or wrong for our our, our patients based upon what the science says, right? If, if it says to do this, you do this. If it says to do that, you do that. And you, you be a good person and be the best clinician you can. Um, but there are some people who practice with concern of defensive medicine. If I don't do this, then I'm liable. And you hear a lot of that, particularly in radiology. You know, if you take too many x-rays, if you don't take this x-ray, if you don't read an x-ray, sure. and people tend to make this huge discussion over x-rays, right? You know, did you take one? Did you not take the one? I feel like labor is very similar in that mm -hmm. if you asked a hundred orthodontists, how many of you, I I'll even go as far as a thousand orthodontists, how many of you have ever been leveled with either state sanctions, federal sanctions, or a wrongful termination lawsuit or an employment lawsuit of any kind, I'm willing to wager the numbers would be very, very low. However, we all practice with the concern of what would happen if, which is prudent. Should part two part question, first part, and I'll let you answer it first. If you were going in your history, see an orthodontist or any business owner get something against them, is it historically from a, uh, a legal perspective, meaning that the state or federal have come in and said, wait a minute, you just violated this rule. Uh, or because I remember, I remember hearing stories about that. And, or is it an employee who is terminated who's making a complaint? Oh, let's, let me rephrase it. Who's doing a wrongful termination suit? So one is they're complaining to the state, state steps in. The other is they're suing you. I know basically we have to be good operators on both sides of that, but which do you see more frequently? I would say uh, it would depend a little bit on the state that you're in. So if you are in a state that is very employee friendly, then we definitely see the state getting involved. California is a great example of that. Um, California is very, as a state, if you're an employee and you want to make a complaint um, to a, against a former employer, California is very friendly to you, very quick to respond, easy to work with, and all of that. If you're in a different state, then the state labor board might be much slower to act. And so as a disgruntled former employee, uh, you would be more likely probably to find a lawyer. Um, and then, you know, it might be a real labor lawyer that that you partner up with. It might just be your buddy who happens to be a, you know, a real estate attorney and knows how to sound scary, right. you know, in a, in a letter. Uh, but typically with that, then the, the first step would be some sort of scary letter that goes to the employer that says, you know, you wrongfully terminated me and here's, you know, all the reasons why you're a terrible person. And, you know, if you don't pay us $50,000, then we're going to sue you. And it's typically at that point that uh, it, it depends on how much documentation and proof you have as the employer. You know, do you have a clear employee handbook that the person signed off on? Do you have performance reviews? Do you have disciplinary written warnings? Do you have, in a sense, documentation that shows that you terminated this person for poor performance as opposed to because they're old or because they're minority or something like that, whatever is being claimed? Um, and if you have that documentation, then typically the first step is your attorney sends copies of that back to this other attorney and basically says, no, this is all BS and here's why. 
And then, uh, then it really comes down to how much does this former employee want to push it and how much money are they willing to put into it? Because this attorney might then say, hey, your case isn't looking very good. I mean, they've got all this documentation. We can pursue this if you want, but you're going to have to start paying my retainer. And at that point, most former employees go, okay, I don't have $5,000 or $10,000 to put up for this when we have no idea if we're going to win or not. And for employers that don't have any of that documentation, though, when they consult with their attorney, typically their attorney says, well, look, you don't have any proof whatsoever. And so you can fight this and it's your word against their word, um, or you can just settle it and it'll probably be cheaper to settle it, unfortunately. And so it's it's really where that that documentation, it's not that it can make the lawsuit always go away entirely. But it really helps uh, with your case and and getting that stuff to go away as much as as much as you can. I, I appreciate that. And as you were speaking, you know, the first thing that ch- popped into my mind is how many times does the defendant, the doctor, um, you know, their attorney just says back to the other one, "Nope, we're not going to settle. We're going to court," just to get that other attorney to say, "Okay, now we're on the books for retainer or what have you," and. And just push it away that way, which is, you know, the inequity in our legal system, which we can get into a whole other time. Uh, but but are there real teeth to these lawsuits? You know, you've got a team member. They're not so great. They screwed up a bunch of times. You talk to them two, three, four times. Hey, you know, Alan, come on, man. We've talked about this three times. If you do this again, I got to let you go. You do it again. It's your 18th time in two months of showing up late. And I don't have documentation. I let you go. You're a thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year employee. Are there teeth to this to where, you know, these if, if if and I'm I'm never advocating, never advocating that we treat people unfairly on any level. But when these things happen, do the lawsuits really have some real teeth or bite to them? Is there real monetary damages of significant proportions that are awarded in these cases? If it if or or are these just much ado about nothing? I would say that in a lot of cases, when it's if we're talking about a claim of harassment, uh, bullying, um, hostile work environment, those ones you can definitely see some real monetary damages. If we're talking about something where the state is getting involved in something, typically the state will levy some small fines, and then you you know if it's something like you were supposed to pay overtime and you didn't pay that properly, the they'll calculate all of that. I would say that one of the risks, though, with these things proceeding to trial or proceeding to that level is just that it it can open your book, so to speak, to everything. Right. Because in the discovery process, they may want all kinds of information on not just one employee, but multiple employees. They may want uh, uh, records going back. And in that process, they may accidentally or at, well, <laughs> they may accidentally, from your standpoint, discover some stuff that really, you know, it is actually even more damaging than the initial claim. And that's definitely the case if a state labor board is getting involved. And you just don't want to go there. So, um, but to your question, absolutely. Some of these things do proceed. It it certainly varies widely depending on the size, the scope, how long the issue is going on, whether we're talking civil, uh, usually it's civil. But anyways, it's, it, it, is a, it is something to be taken seriously. Um, and another big aspect to it that I think people don't always recognize is it, it's so easy to get locked into this thing of am I right or am I wrong? Right. And everyone wants to be right, of course. Yeah. And I mean, we have certainly talked to folks who have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees just so that they could get to the point where the court or the judge says, yes, and, you know, doctor, you you were right and the employee was wrong. And hours of time stress, money, et cetera, to get to that point. And it's really, that's where this whole thing comes into play of, do you really want to go down that path? You know, is that the best right. use of your time? And I know some people are bored and they're looking for something to do. Right. <laughs> I, I'd recommend a more healthy hobby, but, you know, if some people want to get into that, you know, uh, more power to them. But, you know, it's just, um, I think it's so important for folks to focus on what they really care about, what they're passionate right. about. And uh, and take care of these other things um, as best you can. Yeah, speak to any divorce attorney. They'll tell you about people who want to fight over emotion, not over, you know, the the facts well, of the case. And to that point, I will say that you know, 
with a termination, that is the ending of a relationship. It's an employment relationship, but it is the ending of a relationship. And just like divorce and breakups, those can be very heightened, very emotional. And it's not uncommon for someone that had been a a loyal, happy, normal, high-functioning employee for that person to have a flip. And they think, no, you know, if you're going to fire me, I am going to go to war with you. Yeah. And uh, it, so it, yeah, terminations are out of all the different circumstances and things that can happen. Terminations are always the most uh, fraught with potential for some sort of issue or, or blowback. You know, I, I, I've said this a number of times, both in print and uh, in podcast. Um, there was a story many, many years ago. I was a younger dentist. I couldn't have been out of school but five years. I think I'd just taken over my first practice in 1997, five years out of school. And I had done a filling. I know, huge amount of liability, right? (laughs) I'd done a simple, tiny little filling, nothing big. And it worked out beautifully. I mean, it worked out great. But I had a patient who was irrational. I mean, the person was bananas. And the filling was beautiful. There was, there was, no sensitivity. I mean, maybe a drop. It was really a, a nice feeling. And they sent me a letter, right? You know, I want my money back for my filling because, you know, insert crazy reason here, right? Sure. I was in the chair too long. I waited five minutes. I Any number of things. And I called my attorney up. And this was, you know, it's funny how buzzwords come and go. This was back in the days where the National Practitioner Data Bank you know, you're worried about being reported to the to the data bank. I forget what it was called at the time, but uh, you'd be you'd be now leveled as a criminal, so to speak. You know, anyway, I can look up and see any mark if someone did anything. And so I said to my uh, attorney, I said, oh, this person's bananas. They're crazy. And I was so angry that this person had threatened me with reporting me and all these other things. And he just looked at me and said, Glenn. It'll cost you $150 to pay this person for their filling and it goes away. And you will never, ever think about it again, other than joking about it. It'll play such a small piece of your future history, if such a word exists, right? Um, Just pay it. And and you can be right and we can fight this. And as your attorney, I'll tell you, you'll win. And it might take us two or three years and thousands of dollars. Or you can just bite the bullet, recognize in your heart you're right. And just pay it. And right. it was sage advice at a really early time in my career that served me well over the next 25 years that you can be right, right? Or you can have peace of mind. Right. But you sometimes can't have both. And exactly. peace of mind is always, almost, almost always, with a few exceptions, much better than being right. As you know, and that's your point to a T. Um well, and I will say on that too, one of the big things that a lot of folks uh deal with when when there is a termination is unemployment. And a lot of times that comes up, the employee files for unemployment, the employer says, well, this was a terrible employee. I don't think they should get unemployment. They don't deserve it, et cetera. Or they um, they quit. Yeah. Or they quit. And now maybe they're going to get awarded unemployment. And so there's, there's a lot of heightened emotion to that. And our perspective on that is unemployment is not a big deal. And it's something that everyone pays into as long right. as you don't have massive turnover, your rates aren't going to go up. And it, it is one of those things where it can be an escalation. If you really hard fight that unemployment, it's not uncommon that then the employee says, okay, well, if you're going to fight me on that, I'm going to fight you on this other thing and I'm going to get a lawyer and, and, and it escalates. Whereas if you can kind of, you know, as the employer, just take a deep breath and just let them, you know, don't don't fight the unemployment thing. I mean, you still will be truthful in your responses and all of that. But uh, if the employee gets unemployment, the employee then feels like, oh, I really, I, I got really him. got him. I got yeah. him. I got the unemployment <laughs> as if the money comes out of your bank account, which of right. course it doesn't. Uh, and and then they go away, and that's the end of it. And and compared to a wrongful termination lawsuit or or a state labor investigation, unemployment is not a big deal at all. Right. And so just switching gears a tiny drop, there's um there's a situation, there are situations as a former employer myself and a current employer with orthopreneurs, right? I employ some people uh that are maddening, right? You've got a team member, uh, and I I see this come up all the time online. You have a team member who's underperforming, underperforming for ages, they're just not a good team member, uh, maybe not a great attitude, shows up, and you know, you've you've written them up once. And then, you know, they invariably come and tell you they're pregnant, right? 
Uh, and now the game has just changed, right? Sure. Like historically, you know, the the employee who you could, I understand why they're in a protected class. It makes perfect sense to me. An employer could easily go, oh, they're pregnant. Well, I'm going to get rid of them and then get somebody who doesn't have to look after a baby and doesn't have like all the terrible reasons why an employer would do such a thing. Um, and, and those are situations that documentation can only help you so much because there comes a point where you have to be really careful. Mm-hmm. And then there's the other side of the coin where um, this is where I'd love your feedback. Sexual harassment, you mentioned, or harassment, depending upon what part of the country you're from. Uh, I remember you you brought that up about 10 minutes ago uh, about the types of lawsuits that can really have teeth, can really have, you know, right? If you let go of a pregnant employee because you have documentation, they weren't that good. There's probably a limited amount of money that's going to be talked about transactionally here. But mm-hmm. sexual harassment, hey, Dr. Krieger did this to me, or his people who work for him did this to me, and he never stepped in, and he condoned it, da, da, da. Right. So my question for you is this. <laughs> I once got taken behind the woodshed for this, uh, but it's always misunderstood when I ask this question. We would have to believe that for every thousand sexual harassment lawsuits, there is a tremendous amount of merit in the vast majority of them, or at least perceived merit. Right. The mm-hmm. facts will bear out in the case. But as an here's my question, as an employer how do I protect myself? Because it's one of the most difficult things under the law to protect yourself against an accusation that perhaps hasn't been documented fully, right? Like if you, if, if your sister started working for me and 10, you know, five years from now, a year from now claimed there was harassment at the job as the employer, I have no evidence to prove that I didn't harass, right? Mm-hmm. I have no ability unless I, I mean, unless they cite a specific time and a specific day that Dr. Krieger did this and I have a camera says, no, it never happened. I have no doubt there's some degree of harassment lawsuits that are either vengeful or without merit. How do we male and female, because it goes both ways, how do we protect ourselves adequately from the expense of lawsuit that potentially has no merit whatsoever? Or is there really no way to protect yourself from a bad operator? Well, great question. So um, I will say one piece of good news off the bat, which is that we do not hear about harassment claims very often these days. I think there's a greater awareness out there. And some of the basic things like, you know, this is an old one, but, you know, if you're a male dentist and you're interviewing a female candidate and she says, oh, I work a current job, so I need to come after hours, then don't be alone in the practice with this stranger who you've never met. Uh, Beyond that, though, of course, it is. Which, by the way, I just want to I want to add to that. We'll come back to you beyond that. I just want to add. That that's great advice, no matter what. It doesn't matter if there's harassment involved. It doesn't matter if they're a potential employee. Um, for years, I was told by people I respect a ton, both spiritual leaders and other people in my family, that a man who's married or single, I guess, and a woman should not be alone in a potential area, alone at night or wherever it may be. My rabbi went so far as to say, be alone with your mother, your sister, your daughters, and your wife. Nobody else do you, should you ever be alone with of the opposite sex. And there's don't take your secretary to lunch. And it's not from a harassment perspective. His point was when you're on the other side, and you can go ask a minister or a priest, anybody you want to ask, that when you're on the other side of broken relationships of husband and wife, more often than not, it comes from these sorts of innocuous seeming meetings. So your advice, right, don't be alone with a potential employee who you're potentially hiring at night alone. I'm telling everybody out there, in modern day society, you might view me as an old man for saying this, but you know, locks are put on doors to keep honest people out, right? A, a criminal sees a lock and breaks through it. An honest person sees a lock and says, oh, I shouldn't be in there. Do the same thing with personal relationships. Uh, many wiser people than me have made that suggestion, and I'm telling it to all of you now. Do not be alone with a member uh, do not be alone with anybody if you can avoid it in any situation that you you are not intimately aware of and family member or what have you. It can just lead to major problems. And I'm sorry for interrupting you. So you're at beyond that. 
Well, sure. And and that's a good point. And I'll I'll stick on that for one second here and just say that especially if what you are meeting with someone about is something that is heightened and emotional and and you know a counseling session or a termination session, we always recommend having some sort of witness there. Um, and and just having that other person as a witness to to avoid some kind of claim that that you know something happened that didn't happen. So that's that's a big part of it. Um, another trend that we're seeing quite often is that a lot of folks who this tends to be employees that are quite a bit younger, Gen Z, and so on. Um, a common scenario is office manager sits down with them and says, "Hey, your performance is lacking, and here are the areas." Um, not in any kind of mean way. The office manager is just totally, you know, professional and normal. And this is, this is what we need to see from you and our expectations. And then the person says, well, I was being harassed by the office manager and they will use that term harassment, or I was harassed. And the office manager's going, all I did was I just said that they were lacking in these areas. And it's not uncommon this kind of gets to your question about, you know, are these real harassment claims or are they not? And obviously, any claim of harassment has to be taken seriously. There needs to be some sort of investigation, some sort of sit down with the, with both parties, with any potential witnesses. Um, and that investigation process is the really critical piece that is sort of your defense as an employer. Many, many state labor boards have have basically been very clear of the fact that as long as you as the employer did a good faith, you know, interactive investigative process where you really you took the time, you sat down, you really interviewed each person, got written statements, uh, all the various people, talked to other employees. Um, even if at the end of that, your conclusion is this is not harassment or this, you know, uh, didn't require somebody to be terminated. And then later the state labor board disagrees with you. Um, they, they will not, in a sense, as long as your investigation is proper and, and done, you know, in good faith, uh, they will not, in a sense, fine you for a bad decision, so to nice. speak. Nice. Um, now, with that, there are some steps. You need to have a clear written anti-harassment policy in your employee handbook or posted somewhere. That policy or another policy needs to specifically spell out, if you feel you are the victim of harassment, these are the steps to take. Um, and again, that does vary a little bit from state to state. California, uh, Massachusetts, New York, some of those states have very specific harassment protocols that as an employer, you have to follow. And if you're not following that, then that kind of is a ding against you as the employer. And, and um, must I investigate harassment by a fellow employee who's not a superior? You mean like an associate dentist or somebody like that? No, I mean, you know, you hear it all the time. Um, uh, you don't hear it all the time, but you hear about it online all the time. Hopefully you don't hear it in your office a lot. You know, two team members, both assistants, both front desk, both whatever, you know, are just going at it all the time. Oh, I, I mean, I had two employees 25 years ago, both wonderful women, wonderful women, stayed in touch with both of them as friends long term uh, for years, but they just hated each other and they would level comments back and forth that I later found out about when nobody was around, this one would call this one this, this one would call that. And I would certainly have called it, unbeknownst to me at the time, a hostile work environment. But is it can can one employee who's an assistant and has no superior, uh, you know, is not a superior for the other, can that be considered? Is that harassment or is, or is harassment just when you're afraid of your job because of somebody who might be your superior? Can you just go through it real quick what the definition of harassment is from an employer's perspective? Oh, sure. Yeah, it can be all of that. Yeah, it, it, it does, it's not about the role necessarily. The role can come into play with something that is like a quid pro quo. Um, you know, I will give you a raise if you do X for me. Um, but no, it can absolutely be two assistants or two front desk people that are kind of on an equal level from a position standpoint. Absolutely. Harassment is harassment, and it can be threats. It can be uh, any sort of um, belittling of someone. You know, there's certainly some crossover with harassment and bullying and hostile work environment. There's kind of a Venn diagram there. But 
It, uh, yeah, it absolutely can be. It can be the the UPS driver um, constantly making suggestive comments to your front desk person. That can be harassment in the workplace. All of that uh, is something that can definitely take place, and it and it does need to be taken seriously. And in that investigation, ideally, that's when you start to kind of tease apart. Okay, is this one person really is the perpetrator and another is the victim are both of them perpetrators and victims and then based on that then you pick a path as far as where you're going to go in terms of disciplinary action against one or both of them or sit downs as a starting point and trying to figure this out and mediate as best you can yeah i mean it's remarkable um we see it come in all forms and i just didn't know legally i mean look as a doctor, as an off, I don't care, employee, owner, whatever I might be, if I'm standing in my reception area and I see a UPS driver coming to make a snotty comment or a snide sexual remark to one of my team members, it's not going to end nicely, right? And and I'm certainly going to step in, not from a legal perspective, but I'm going to step in and give them a good dressing down, probably call UPS and make a statement or a complaint or what have you. And, and my assumption, just because we're on that particular topic, because you brought it up, if an outside vendor were to make a comment to one of my team members, um, how is that held under, under the law? Obviously, it's wrong. It should never happen. It has happened. I've heard stories where it's happened to a female, particularly female doctors, where somebody from a company comes in and they're selling something and makes a comment, a snide remark. Do they have grounds? I mean, I, get, I assume they have grounds against the company, correct? Well, it, it falls under the workplace, though. Even though it's happening from an outside vendor, the fact that it's happening at work, that is the, in a sense, the part that makes it the employer's responsibility. Now, obviously, you can't control UPS and what UPS does as a company and, and their scheduling system and those kind of things. You can certainly decide who you're going to do business with and who you're not. Um, and again, this is where that investigative sort of process comes into play right. where the state and, and the federal government really want to, they want to see you as the employer demonstrating that you made an effort to do this. I always say one of the, one of the worst things you can do as an employer is, uh, uh, you know, hear about some major issue of harassment or bullying or something like that. And then say, oh, well, you know, I already have this vacation for the next two weeks and I'm leaving the office and I'm going to leave, you know, everyone here and working while I'm gone. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll deal with this when I come back. You know, those are the kind of things. Right. Do not do that because that shows to an outside observer that you're not taking this seriously. Fair enough. Um, so all of that it, it comes into play. It, it's so important that you that you go through that investigative process and make sure that that you're demonstrating your commitment to your employees and your employees will see that, you know, this is a great example of something where um, your employees will realize that you have their back, you are supporting them. Right. And, uh, and, you know, you're not going to let, you know, a, a, a UPS driver get away with something like this. Yeah, exactly. And we, we, again, I can't speak for everybody, but in my practice, there have been times I've thrown patients out of my office for doing things to my team member or saying something rude, or like you said, uh, drivers who are just nasty or rude, I've pulled them aside in had conversations. So, you know, you just want to take good care of the people around you in general, uh, if for no other reason than just taking good care of the people around you. And Absolutely. I think all of this illustrates one thing, that none of us is a master of HR, that we need companies like Bent Erickson to protect us, to help create the, the, the employee handbook, to make sure it's up to date, to make sure the changing state and federal laws are included in the provisions in that in that, in that we're you know, we have a question or an issue, and I'm putting COVID behind us for the time being, because it was certainly a great resource during that time period. But as a former Bent Erickson client myself, it's so nice to have somebody that somebody says something and you just don't know the answer of it, right? Again, using the pregnant team member. I don't care if you're a male or a female, your pregnant team member comes to you, the one that's underperforming, that the one you were about to fire, and the day, two hours before you're about to fire them, they tell you they're pregnant. You need to call your HR expert and say, okay, what do I do now? That's number one. Number two, another area of expertise that Ben Derrickson and yourself are really good at is talking about hiring and retaining team members. Sure. And I, I've, I've, I've been a very, very outspoken individual in terms of saying that I think the shortage of good team members poses a true existential crisis to the survival of orthodontics long term, or at least the way we knew 
It's already changing dramatically, becoming much more technology reliant, uh, trying to ameliorate a lot of the concerns we have with team members just getting filled in positions. Most are understaffed. Most have been understaffed for years now, not for weeks or months like it used to be. Um, and, and so offer some strategies, if you don't mind, first of all, on finding because a large percentage of the people in the world of orthodontics or dentistry who would have been assistants are now finding that they can make the same amount of money potentially working out of their home or driving an Uber or selling right. on Etsy, right? Mm -hmm. Digital, the, the digital economy has changed the potential workforce for us. How are we finding and retaining uh, great team members? And what are your best practices? Sure. Well, yeah, I'll go through some quick ones here. We could talk for three hours about this, but um, so I, I think of it as short term, long term. So short term, very short term would be there are emerging companies that are basically like Uber for temps. So you pull out your phone, you say, I want a, a temp assistant tomorrow. And somebody in the geographic region that's also on the app says, okay, cool. I'll take that gig tomorrow. And they show up. Uh, these companies, there's a couple of them that I know of, they're still coming out and emerging. Um, from a, a HR compliance standpoint, I would say be careful about how you are classifying these people as employees versus contractors. But that's kind of one emerging thing that I think will gain in popularity over time. Um, one thing is to step up your game with interviews. I, it blows me away how many employers are not asking behavioral-based interview questions. You know, there's things like general questions. You know, what's what, why are you applying for this job? There's credential experience uh, questions, things like that. Behavioral-based questions, though, are things like. Describe for me a time in your last uh, job where you had a difficult patient and how did you handle that? Right. Or describe for me a time when a when a patient was upset about their their bill and their insurance options and, and what did you do to resolve that? Right. Um, because if you ask someone, you know, are you good at customer service? Are you reliable? Oh, yeah. Are you uh, uh, dependable? Well, of course, everyone knows that the answer. I'm amazing. I show up all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And part of behavioral-based questions or something that ties in with that is calling past employers or, or checking references. And really for us, when we say references, we mean calling past employers, not right. you know their, their buddy that they put on the resume. Um, another thing that we recommend, and, and this is really difficult right now with how tight the hiring market is, is um, you know, getting a true apples to apples comparison of, of two different jobs. And so one of the things that we recommend doing, and we have a form that we can share with folks if, if they're interested, is sort of a total compensation uh, and benefits calculation of all the wages, all the benefits, all the bonuses, the all the various things from this job. So it's not just about, well, this job pays me more a dollar an hour. Right. So that can be a useful tool. I think for something that's a little bit more long term, um, you just need to make your office an outstanding place to work. It needs to be the kind of place where people don't want to leave, uh, the kind of place where maybe people even show up with resumes and say, hey, Dr. Krieger, I know you're not hiring right now, but when you are, I want right. to work here because I've heard such amazing things from other employees. Um, a lot that, of people are familiar. That used to happen. Used to. It, it oh, seemed okay. to happen. It just it's hard because again the workforce has changed. But man, those are the halcyon days of hiring. Yeah, exactly. Well, and part of that is you know we, as as business owners, we spend a lot of time on our USP, our unique selling proposition. You know, why should right. a patient choose our office versus somewhere else? We've have one we call the UEP, the unique employment proposition. Again, why should a high quality, awesome, great attitude, perfect employee? Why should they choose your practice versus the one down the street? And can you clearly articulate to that? Uh, candidate what that UEP is. So we really right. encourage folks to spend at least as much time on that as they have on their USP. Um, we're also a, a big point. fan of um, big fan of appreciation in the workplace. The, uh, the That's a book that has been around for years, The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace. It's a companion book to The Five Love Languages, if people are familiar with that one. Right. Um, it's a great one for dentistry because it's very simple. The concepts are super intuitive, and uh, it doesn't cost a lot of time or money to deal with it. Um, and that, by the way, that's a huge thing in the workplace is... Yeah. Um, it took me 20 years. I'm not the most emotionally intelligent individual. My wife will tell you I'm either the smartest dumb person or the dumbest smart person she's ever met. I like to think of myself as the smartest dumb person. Then I'm king of the idiots. You know, if you're just the dumbest smart person, you're a nobody. Right. Um, but it took me about 20 years in practice to recognize um, 
which may come very intuitively to some people who are watching or listening, that the way people want to be thanked is radically different. Yeah. One person wants gifts. The other wants just, you know, uh, words of affirmation. Somebody right. else, acts of service mean a huge amount. Hey, I did this. I cleaned down. I took out the trash for you. Like there are team members out there that if one day you just pick up the trash in the in the office and take it to the dumpster, they will be your employee for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. Like, it, it, and you'd say just for taking out the trash. Well, yeah, because they don't care if you say what a great job they did. They don't, you know, they don't care if you give them a gift at Christmas. And that's and 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 that's where you know at Christmas time you're all the team. So what are you giving your team for Christmas? What do you and there's a good chance that 80% of the people in your team couldn't care less about the gift you're giving them. That right. It could just be what they want is a really nice word of affirmation telling them how much they mean to you mm -hmm. and, and just time with you. Quality yeah. time. Quality time. Quality time is huge. Yeah. Just sitting down and saying, okay, for the next 20 minutes, I'm putting my phone away. I'm, there's not going to be any distractions. And we are just going to talk one-on-one -on -one about you and your job and how I can support you yep. in that. Yeah. Those kind of things are huge. Huge. It's a great point you made. And I again, to take away from all of this, for everybody listening, um, if you're a, an employer, ask your team members to take the five love language quiz and find mm -hmm. out how to communicate with them and thank them the, in the best way. We've done it for years now. Mm -hmm. And if you're an employee, encourage your uh, employer to do the same. And, and if not, at least talk to them and say, hey, by the way, I know you never asked, but when I do something really good for you or something you really like, here's what connects with me the most. Now, if they say, screw you, I don't care, you may want to rethink that relationship. Sure. Um, but if if they're amenable, like most would be, It'll mean something when it comes back. And, yeah. and there's a book. I, I keep looking over my right shoulder because I just I just used it. Literally, it's on a top shelf and I can't get to it uh, or I'm not going to leave the interview here's, to do it. But here's my copy here. There you go. Th that's a great book. Well, th that's a great That's not the book I was looking for. The book I'm looking for is 96. I just rearranged all my books. It's 96 interview questions, basically. Uh -huh. But okay. based upon what you talk about, it explains chapter by chapter how to ask questions related to specific things, work history. Um, we don't deal with mass termination very often. But, you know, if you're, say, in a car industry, whatever it might be, and a thousand people got laid off of Amazon, for instance, and you see that on their on their CV, oh, you were laid off at Amazon. There are specific questions you should ask related to that to help you better understand the individual, because like you said best. At the end of the day, everybody's really good at telling you how they show up every day, ready for work, and they persevere through such difficulty, and they're going to be the best employee ever. Yeah, and, best um, employee ever. Yeah. Is it ever wrong, or or am I breaking any rules or laws to look a, a potential hire or somebody I'm about to hire and say, hey, and I've heard this said on the stage at orthodontic meetings, um, hey, um, you know, Alan, it's so great to have you as part of the team. We're hiring you. Now, today you showed up with your hair all done beautifully. Now, this conversation is often had between a man and a woman. And these are the exact words I've heard mentioned. Hey, today on this interview, you care about the way you look, your hair, your makeup, your clothing. You've taken some great time, energy, and effort to present a version of yourself so that we would hire you. And it's worked because we think you're an amazing person, both inside and outside. And we're expecting that every day when you come to work, this is the person we get, not one who hasn't taken the time to, to present themselves fairly. Can you touch that when hiring somebody or have I just violated the law? I would say in general, something like that would be OK. I think one of my concerns with it is that it it almost kind of is based on an assumption that this person might not look that way on an ongoing basis and they might say they might have that or or it's almost like it implies maybe this office kind of got burned on that in the past or maybe they had someone who didn't do that uh i and and obviously with appearance stuff yeah you can get into some potential weirdness with people and their feelings about their yeah appearance. of course uh one emerging trend in hr is protections for um uh certain hairstyles that are related to you know race or historically related to race so there are things like that that start to touch on that um 
You know, one thing that we are big fans of, though, is sharing your appearance policy with applicants. Right. If you're really strict about piercings or tattoos or, or you know, the hair, the hair color must be of a natural color. Those kind of things absolutely can be shared. That's even something you can put in the job posting. And then in are theory, you allowed you're not to? Even... Oh, sure. I, I remember the old lawsuit with the piercings, right? Um, I think it was a Costco employee sued Costco, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, Costco, if I'm wrong, please don't sue me. Um, but I believe it was somebody who said there's a church of, I'm screwing this whole one up. Have you heard this? That they claim that their piercings were a function of some religious principle. And you, right, you know what I'm talking about. Well, sure. And that's a common thing with with any sort of religious principles, whether it be, you know, a, a hijab or or some some other kind of appearance factor. And that is that is admittedly kind of a different story. And and this idea of um, something being a, a, a factor in someone's religion, yeah, that is certainly something to, to take into account. When you present the appearance policy, though, it's about saying, this is our appearance policy, these are our standards, and then it's about the employee saying, well, hey, I can meet these with certain modifications or accommodations, and then there can be a conversation about whether those accommodations can be met, need to be met, and so on. Yeah, it's just, you know, like I said, the beautiful thing here is that it's nice to have somebody uh, in your back pocket uh, like you, where I can pick up the phone, make a quick phone call, have an HR specialist on the phone with me saying, hey... This happened at lunch. Two of my team members went out for lunch. They came back. This is what I heard. One is complaining about this one. One's complaining about this. What should I do? Right now, granted, that's an acute situation as opposed to I had a team member not show up today. This is their fourth time not showing up. You know, I don't think this is going to work out long term. How should I set the stage now to do this both legally and fairly? Right. Right. Like nobody wants to just tell somebody, hey, you just got fired. But if you feel like you've done them a service and treated them well and kindly, it makes the separation choice of word. It makes the separation that much easier later on. And so it's good to have folks like you in our lives Um, and 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 rowing in the same direction. I had to throw that in there, Alan. (laughs) Alan, As we close things down here, I just have to bring this up. Alan is not only an amazing vice president. But he's also historically as has a fun fact as a rower um, mm-hmm. at the highest level. And I did you do something in England? I, I'm I'm five foot nine and a half on a really good day. Um, and and you're probably what like six foot eleven, seven feet. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> only six foot two. That's all. That's all. Yeah, yeah. and that's a short rower. Like that's <laughs> that is yeah. I, that's, yeah. I, I like it's crazy. So what did you do in England as a rower? I have to ask. Well, so my last year rowing in college, uh, we were invited to a regatta in England called the Henley Royal Regatta, and and it's a <laughs> it's a super classic, very old regatta in England. It's on the Thames River, and it it's over a week in July. It is just an absolute blast. It's it's unlike any other any other regatta that's out there because. It's on a river, so it's a very narrow course. Only two boats race at a time. It's just two boats head to head. There's no big, you know, heats of of eight boats all racing, and then and then it winnows down. It is an absolute blast. And over in England, rowing is like like football or or baseball. Here, it is a massive spectator sport. So you've got thousands of people lining the river, cheering you on. You've got the haves and the have nots. There's a thing called the stewards enclosure where they don't let you in unless you're wearing a coat and tie. As a woman, you have to wear a hat and a dress that covers all the way to your ankles. Wow. Um, and then just outside that, you've got people putting their beer in the river to keep it cold, getting in fights, passing out in the sun. <laughs> it is it is an absolute blast. So yeah, we had the chance to row over there. I, I wish I could say that we, you know, took home the trophy, but uh, we got beat by the Irish national team, and uh, those guys were were massive. So you know, compared when you to say all of massive, us, massive, you're talking big. Oh yeah, big, big guys, very tall, very scrappy, and just uh, yeah, they they kind of killed us in our last race there. But it was super fun. You know, rowing is a is an awesome sport from a team standpoint. I, I really don't know of any other sport where you have to. You have to be, you know, in sync at that level while performing at such a, a, a massive cardio and, and uh, you know, fitness level. So, yeah, super fun. Um, highly recommend it if, if folks are interested. It's a great, great sport. That's amazing. And I, you know, I value what you do because I ditched my Peloton. I mean, I use it once on a blue moon now, but my uh, my hydro 
Um, you know, I, a couple of times a week minimum, I love it. And I got to tell you, rowing, I, I don't know why I, I, you know, and now that I know about rowing, why do I ever get on my, a bike, right? It's a full body workout, it's flexibility, it's core, it's everything. And it's kind of interesting that even going crazy, I can't get my heart rate as high as I can biking, but I'm, I feel like I'm working way harder. And, sure. uh, you know, and again, for everybody out there, um, I think this is an amazing metaphor for what you do to help all of us because with you in my corner, I really do feel like I've got somebody who's telling me what to do and how to do it. And that we're, it's a dance, it's a row that, you know, it's a regatta, if you will, because, um, if we're not in sync with what you're telling us, we're exposing ourselves to some bigger issues. And, yeah. uh, it's just really, really nice to have you, uh, as part of our team, you know, when I, when it was. Yeah. And I, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, uh, wants to learn more or maybe has a specific situation they want to discuss, how's, how's the best way to get a hold of you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Folks can reach out to me via email. My email is alan at benerickson.com. And our phone number is 1-800-679-2760. And we're, of course, on the internet, benerickson.com. So yeah, I mean, any questions folks have in the HR world, we're always happy to happy to talk about it. I mean, HR is a skill like everything. Nobody's born good at it or born bad at it. You just got to you got to take a little bit of time, have some awareness, you know, get some coaching, so to speak. And, uh, and, you know, it can, it can be something that is basically an easy, well, maybe, maybe not always easy, but something that can be as, as painless as possible for your practice. So yeah, like I said, at the beginning, HR is our passion. We, we love it. And so we're always happy to help folks and chat about it. It's awesome. And I'll just add, um, HR is one of those things that the more you learn, the more experience you have, the more you realize you don't know anything. You know, when I came out of school, I knew nothing about HR and I thought it was just a simple thing. And like I said, 30 years later, there are so many nuances to it that sure. it's remarkable. And so uh, don't believe that you know it all. Uh, don't try to do this on your own. The options are affordable uh, and, mm-hmm. and it's good to have an expert in your corner. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for having you here today, Alan. Thank you for being on the show. And again, if anybody wants to reach out to, to him, Please reach out to him through his phone number, through the website. Ben Derrickson is on the web, as he said. And uh, just thank you. And at some point down the road, we'll have you back and we'll do another update on this. All right. Sounds good. That's the thing about HR. It's always changing. There's always something new. So, yeah. There it is, unfortunately. Yeah. Wonderful today, Dr. Krieger. Thank you. You too. Take care, Alan. Thank you for being here.